Thank you, guys. And would, uh, you all turn with me to the book of Proverbs as we continue our journey through that book. And um, as you do, would you all join me in a time of prayer for Mike Morgan? Uh, those of you who are part of our congregation, you know that Mike Morgan has been suffering. He's down in the hospital. He had come home. He had to go back in last night. And he is suffering with bleeding in his, uh, in his brain. And so... Um, if you would just join me for a time of prayer, we can lift him up as a family. Father, I just want to pray for Mike and Kathy. I, I pray that you, as I prayed with her this morning, I, I pray that you, Father, would uh, work out your sovereign plan in this situation. Father, we know that all healing comes from you. We know that you are fully capable of touching him right now and removing all bleeding removing all swelling, removing all things that have been affected right now. But Father, we know that sometimes that your will is, uh, you have a greater plan, you have a greater glory in this. And so we pray that you would give uh, Kathy the peace of mind, uh, give Mike the courage and the strength um, to be there for one another and to um, just to trust you in this. And Father, to have peace in this. And who knows, maybe there's a doctor down in Balboa that needs to know who Jesus is. And maybe that's the reason why they're there. And so I pray, Father, that you would be glorified in this situation and that you um, would bring comfort as well. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And so with that said, um, we are going to dive into the topic of marriage. And I was just joking uh, right before I came in here that I'm looking at a bunch of people that have been married much longer than I have. And so I am very grateful that I teach what God says rather than my own opinions because uh, I need to get the rest of you up here probably. Uh, but just for fun, I want to see how many of you have been married for 10 years or more. Notice that my hand is not up. I've made it eight. <laughs> um, how about 20 years? 30? 40? 50, 60, <laughs> all right, I should have a prize to give out, but I don't, uh, that is amazing, what, what a blessing that is to have that many couples, to have their hands raised for that many years in one place, so if you are a single, newly married you saw who you need to be talking to, you need, okay? And all of you who had your hands up raised for 50, I want to see you on Wednesday night for a small group Bible study so that they can hammer these things out, all right? Um, but uh, the first thing that we're going to see, if you're following along on your outline, is that the book of Proverbs and all throughout the Bible, it uses the language that marriage is a covenant. Marriage is a covenant. In Proverbs chapter 2, verse 16, it, meaning wisdom, will save you also from the adulteress, from the wayward wife with her seductive words, who has left the partner of her youth and ignored the covenant she made before God. You know, one of the things that's probably the most striking difference between what the Bible has to say about marriage and what culture has to say about marriage is this idea of covenant. And it's interesting to see to me um, how in one, in one sense, culture is saying to us that marriage is a contract, that you enter into it as two people that come together and say, my life will be better with you than it will be by myself. And so as long as that is true, I will be happy to be married to you. And as soon as it is not true, then the contract is null and void we go and get uh, our certificate of divorce, and we part our ways. That's what culture says in one hand, but then there's this strange remnant that still seems to still be around, in which uh, the two occasions that I have people coming and requesting to use our facility or ask me to participate in are when they get married or when they have a funeral arrangement that they have to take care of. 
there still seems, even though on the one hand, that we have countries like Europe who actually give marriage licenses out, like driver's licenses. And they have an expiration date, and you can choose to renew them or not. I, I don't know if you knew that. I just learned that this week. But on the one hand, you have that, but then you also have people who somehow know that on those two occasions that they're supposed to be in a church and they're supposed to have a minister marrying them. And it's very interesting. And they will stand at an altar and they'll invite all of their friends and family to, say, to hear them say these words, till death do us part. And they may not realize it, but the Bible clearly says that when you say those words, you're saying them, not just in front of your friends and family, you're saying them in front of God. And you are, that's a serious commitment, a serious covenant that you've agreed into. And God takes this, so, this covenant so seriously that in Malachi chapter 2, verse 14, the prophet Malachi says on behalf of God, you ask why? It is because the Lord is acting as the witness between you and the wife of your youth, because you have broken faith with her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Has not the Lord made them one? In flesh and spirit they are his, and why one? because he was seeking godly offspring. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith with the wife of your youth. I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel. And I hate a man's covering himself with violence as well as with his garment, says the Lord Almighty. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith. It's not very often that you hear God utter the words, I hate something. And he says that here. I hate divorce. God is the one who actually created the institution of marriage. When Adam and Eve were created in the garden, it was originally Adam, and God says, it's not good for man to be alone. I will create a helper suitable for him. And so from his rib, he created Eve. And it says even before, there wasn't even a father and mother at this point, but it says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And Jesus added to that, what God has joined together, let not man separate. That marriage is supposed to actually be a picture of who God is and his relationship with us in actually Jesus' death on the cross and his marriage to his bride, the church. Marriage is supposed to be a picture of God to a world of people, of people who need to know him. And so God says, I hate it when two people who have been joined together by me break apart. And it's connected, marriage is connected to this idea of the love of God, the chesed of God. You kind of have to spit a little bit when you say it, okay? Um, and the chesed of God, it, it, it's a wide-ranging word because it talks about his love and his kindness. And in fact, some of your translation will say loving kindness whenever it has this word. But it also has with it this idea of truth and of justice, and of holiness. And it gives us this bigger picture of God. And it's interesting that if you think about those two things, that they come in perfect union on the cross of Jesus. That when Jesus died on the cross, the justice of God was satisfied, and the love of God was perfectly displayed. And so the cross of Jesus could be said to be the greatest act of his said in history. And didn't Jesus say that, that there's no greater love than a man who can lay down his life for his friends. And so this idea of covenant comes from this word of love. And in the New Testament, the word is agape. And that word agape 
It means an unconditional love. It's a pursuing love. It's an initiating love. And so often, our love is contractual. It's conditional. I will do this for you if you do this for me. I will continue to love you if you continue to love me in return. And God's kind of love, it is a one-way road that pursues, it initiates, it never gives up, it always keeps going, always keeps after. And that's what marriage is supposed to be modeled after. And the truth of the matter is that a marriage will only be as strong as its least committed member. If either one of you has in, in your vocabulary the option of divorce, your marriage will be hindered. Because one person can throw out there the whole has said agape love, the one-way street. You can keep on loving, but if the other has um, expectations, if they have limits, if theirs is conditional, and if they're ready to walk as soon as their needs are met, your marriage will never get stronger than the least committed member in the marriage. And so God says that marriage is a covenant. So what we want to do is, throughout the book of Proverbs, it gives good examples and bad examples. And we're going to pick on the men and the women, women first, okay, um, and we're going to show bad examples, good examples, okay? And um, so the way that this usually works is when I say I'm going to talk to the women, that all the men perk up and the women stop listening. And then when I say I'm going to talk to the men, the opposite happens. So I'm going to ask you to, to stay tuned. And even for those of you who are single and you're not married right now, I know that every single one of us knows somebody who is. And chances are, the odds are, statistics say, this will be you at some point if it's not now. And so... God has something to say through his word to us all. And so let's start with the women. And first, uh, let's start with the, the bad so we can get into the good, okay? Um, so the first type of wife that Proverbs talks about is the shameful wife. And obviously, this is the wife who brings shame to her husband, to her family. And so the first type of this is the quarrelsome wife. And Proverbs 21.9 says this, Better to live on a corner of the roof than to share a house with a quarrelsome wife. And I, I notice it's really silent in this room right now. <laughs> but that, you know, come on, that's a little bit funny, okay? Um, you got a guy who's saying, like, I'm just going to go and hide on the roof because that's better than being inside the house. And, you know, it doesn't really take a, a long time of being with a couple when you watch them interact together before you realize the quality of life of the husband or the wife in that, in that marriage. If you see that, that, you know, they're just constantly picking on each other, complaining, nagging on each other, and just arguing, you know that the quality of life is not that great. And you know, it, particularly guys, we're guilty of just kind of like avoiding situations and if things aren't going the way that we want to, we'll just kind of go and hide somewhere, probably the garage, because that's where a lot of guys go. They'll go work on their cars, go fix things, or maybe you go on the roof. I don't know. But being a quarrelsome wife, and the worst is when you do this in front of people. If you do this in front of other people that are their friends, coworkers, people that you know, are trained to respect them and other aspects of life, then this is going to be a huge thing. And for guys, Ephesians 5 tells us that one of the biggest things for us is respect. And so it says to wives, submit to your husbands and respect your husbands because that is something that they carry a load on their shoulders that they feel that they need to be the provider for their household. They feel that they need to be the leader of the home. And so when they are cut down by you, the one that they're supposed to be providing for, the one they're supposed to be leading, it really knocks them down. And it takes the wind out of their sails. The next wife is the loud wife. Proverbs 9.13 says, The woman folly is loud. 
She is undisciplined and without knowledge. She sits at the door of her house on a seat at the highest point of the city, calling out to those who pass by, who go straight on their way. This is the person who just has a strong opinion on everything, and yet they are totally uninformed about everything. This is the person that if you're at a community pool, and you're out there with friends, and then all of a sudden there's an individual who comes in, and they sit down, and you hear them coming all the way from their hotel room, right? Okay? And you hear them talking about, complaining about everything, and they just kind of... And then you watch the dynamic, because as they sit down, out in just a few minutes, that entire side of the pool is cleared out. And people have just decided to go back to their house or go and change their seat or something. And nobody really wants to be around this. But if you watch a married couple, in which is the case, you'll see a wife who's being very loud, and you'll see a husband who's kind of acting like the teenager with his mom in the car as he drives by his friends. He's kind of sinking down. I don't know this person. Okay, Because it, at the same time that she is elevating herself, it is is downplaying him, and it is making him feel inadequate. The third wife is the wife that abandons the covenant. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, we've already read it. This is the adulteress, the wayward wife, with her seductive words, who's left the partner of her youth and ignored the covenant she made before God. You know, it used to be thought that adultery was a male issue. You know, you would always hear stories of men who were always away at work, and so then they would have an affair, and they would abandon their family, abandon their kids. And the interesting thing today is that there's actually a lot of women who are doing this as well. And something that our culture has thrown on, because men are typically visually stimulated, and women are typically not. But the thing is that our culture has so perverted things and thrown so many different images at us that women are actually getting caught up in things like pornography now. And we're finding that women are leaving their, their husbands and their families and they're abandoning them just as much. And in fact, the interesting thing is in my ministry and in my friendships and my interactions with other people, about 80% of the marriages that have broken up over this kind of thing have actually been the woman who has initiated. The woman who has sought something outside of her marriage. And so this is not a male issue only. This is male, female. We've got to protect ourselves. We've got to protect our marriages. And I'm going to say this that you need to create boundaries and guardrails in your marriage to protect you from this. And I'll give you an example of one of ours. Um, one of the things when Amy and I got married is we kind of had to restructure all our friendships. All of our friends either became our friends or they became not our friends. Because this whole idea of I have my friend, she has her friend, she has her life, I have my life, that wasn't going to work. That's not marriage. Okay, that's two separate individuals who live in the same house together. Marriage is when you share life together. And so one of the things we had to go through is she had some male friends, and they either had to become our friends or they weren't going to be friends at all. And I had some female friends, and the same thing. You see, if you once you get married, the whole idea of having that female that you can fight in and you share your heart with, or maybe you share even your struggles and your relationship, you are asking for trouble. That is huge danger. And when you have men and work, women working now outside the home, and they're in a, a marketplace, and they have to work with people of the opposite sex, there's a lots of room where there's real danger. And Jesus warned us that adultery can be mental. Adultery can be here, it can be here, without it ever taking place out here. And in fact, I would challenge you to come up with any circumstance where there's actually adultery committed where it hasn't first happened here and here. And if you find in any way, shape, or form 
that any of that starting to happen. You need help. You need to seek help. You need to get out of that relationship. You need to break it off right now. So now let's get on to the excellent wire. The excellent wire. And the first aspect of this wife is that she builds her house. Proverbs 14.1 says, The wise woman builds her house, but with her own hands the foolish one tears her down. And of course this doesn't mean that she physically builds like carpentry skills. Okay? She's t- it's talking about that she is the one who is initiating the household. Okay? She's taking care of the household. She's taking care of the family. Something that I really find interesting is that most men are very focused in on their career, their objective, what they're pursuing, and they're going after it full force because they feel the brunt of being the provider. But the woman feels very much like she has to take care of the family. Her primary passion, most of the time, is the family. And so, guys, again, we like to avoid things and think everything's going to be okay. Yeah, it doesn't feel that great between us right now, but that's going to get passed, and time heals all wounds. And it's usually the wife who will come to the husband and say, hey, there's something that we need to talk through. Hey, there's a book that I want us to go through. Hey, there's this conference that I want us to go to. I want us to strengthen our marriage. I want us to become better better parents. I, you know, there's something that we need to work on. And they're the ones that will keep going at it. They're the ones that will keep the home together. They're the ones that will keep the marriage together. And Proverbs says that's a great thing when that happens. Next, it says that she fears the Lord. Proverbs 31.30. And by the way, Proverbs 31, almost the entire chapter is dedicated to this excellent wife. This woman of noble character who her husband, her family, and everybody in town loves her. And so I commend that to your study. But verse 30 says this. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. You know, as much as guys may not show it um, a lot of times by their actions, And as much as culture has kind of sucked us all into this standard of beauty that is um, unapproachable, and it doesn't really even exist, it's airbrushed, it's created. And even though guys kind of just kind of get their heads turned and they're visually stimulated and just going like this, you know, all of us deep down, we realize and we know to be true that that's fleeting. We know that 10 years from now, as much as we say we want to get the most beautiful person as our wife, we know that in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the road, that's not going to be the thing that we love the most about them. And when that passes, what's going to remain is who they are on the inside. And so deep down, all of us good Christian men want to find somebody who praises the Lord, somebody who loves Jesus, somebody who is pursuing that with everything she has, and she loves him even before her husband. That's what we really want. Third, it says, she mentors younger wives. Titus chapter 2, verse 3, likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way that they live. Not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. Older women are supposed to mentor younger women. And they're supposed to be an example and they're supposed to pass on to another generation. God, in his word, is constantly concerned about the next generation having all of the character traits, the gospel, knowing who Jesus is, knowing your history, knowing all the great things that he's done, and having that passed on to the next generation. And this, in the family, is one of the things that's in grave danger 
in this generation. The definition of family, the definition of marriage, all of those things are up for grabs. They're being challenged. They're being taught various different things in public schools. And our kids desperately need models that they can look to. They desperately need to see somebody who's made it in marriage. People that still love each other after being married for 30, 40 years. Because hardly anybody has it. So let's move on to the men. I picked on the women long enough, and all the women said? Amen. All right. <laughs> so we're going to deal first with the cruel husband. Cruel husbands. And, you know, in Ephesians 5, what it says that women seem to love, need most is love. They need a man who is willing to put her first and to, to give her everything, even to lay down his life like Jesus did. And so the first thing that Proverbs says that we can, be to, we can do to be a cruel husband is to choose the wrong friends. Proverbs 24, verse 1. Do not envy wicked men. Do not desire their company for their hearts plot violence and their lips talk about making trouble. You know, one of the greatest mistakes that a man can actually make in his marriage is just hanging out with the wrong people. Choosing the wrong types of friends. Choosing friends who want to get together and do things that you know your wife's going to be mad about you, mad about when you get home. The types of friends who want to speak badly about their relationships and they look at you and they want you to do the same. Or maybe they even have the courage to speak badly about your wife. Those are the types of friends that are going to get you in nothing but trouble. And it's not really wise to be around those types of people. And so the Bible says first to the husbands, choose your friends wisely. If you want to be surrounded by people who love their wives, who love their kids, that are devoted to their kids, who love Jesus, okay? And that their primary goal is raising godly children and having a godly marriage. That's the type of people you want to be surrounded by. We minister and reach out to the other people. But we have as our friends those who love Jesus. The second thing about a husband is that sometimes they can be always away from the home. Proverbs 27 verse 8 says, Like a bird that strays from its nest is a man who strays from his home. You know, an interesting thing is that... Uh, None of us really realize how much time we actually had until we get married or have kids, and then you realize how much time you had. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with having hobbies. Everybody needs rest. Everybody needs relaxation. Everybody needs to have fun to enjoy themselves. But the thing that I have found as I have taken this journey of you know eight years and then five years with kids is that if you are really going to be invested in being a hard-working, providing husband, and you're also going to be very devoted to having a strong relationship with your kids and being there for them and being invested in their growth, then you're not going to have a huge amount of time to do all sorts of other things. Every once in a while, that's great if you have friends that you know are the same life stage and you just kind of go off with them every once in a while. But the whole thing of, you know, just every day after work, just going and grabbing some drinks <coughs> with the guys, that's not really biblical. That's not really healthy. And your kids need you. And trust me, your wife needs you to come home and give her a break from the kids, right? They need somebody who's going to be there. And it's cruel when you're not. And by the way, this is a good thing. You know, I, I don't want to, when I say that, I'm not saying that that's like a punishment. And if you view it as a punishment, then that tells you that there's a problem. 
If you don't want to go home, then there is a problem. It's a huge problem. And you need to find counseling. You need to find help. You need to find some way to deal with, address, and lead into, the, into that problem so that that's not the case. The next thing that a cruel husband does is verbally abuse their spouse and their kids. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18. Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue lasts only a moment. You know that old saying, you know, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me? That is a lie. That, that is nonsense. Words can sting you much more than rocks and sticks and weapons. One of the things in having two boys and a third on the way that I have realized is that little boys are hardwired towards certain types of toys. They like superheroes, right? They like warriors. They like knights. They like guns. And, you know, they, they like to play war. They like to wrestle and then when they haven't gotten to wrestle for a long time, they get, ah, they just have something in them. They just need to wrestle. And so as a dad, it's very important to, to do that with your kids. But something you need to teach your boys is that they need to be able to switch in between the warrior mode, the conquering mode, the one that's going to become a leader someday who's going to go out and charge the world, and the gentle, kind man who is able to treat people with respect and especially teaching them how to treat, treat women with respect. And if they have sisters, start with the sisters. Start having them open the door for mom because when they, when they, how they treat their mom, it's going to be how they treat their wife. And if you're single and if you're a female, watch for that, okay? Because it's true. But now let's get on to the kind husband. And the first thing that Proverbs says about a kind husband is that they are a one-woman man. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18. May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be captivated by her love. Why be captivated, my son, by an adulteress? Why embrace the bosom of another man's wife? Everything we've said about culture and the standard that it projects out there for beauty, guys, I'm going to say this as bluntly as I can, that your wife needs to be your standard of beauty. And that is who she is, Right now, not your wife five years ago, okay? Right now. So if your wife has black hair, you're into black hair. If your wife has a lot of jewelry, you're into a lot of jewelry. Whoever your wife is, that's your standard of beauty. And you need to have be blinded to everything else. Nothing else is an option. Nothing else interests you. Nothing else is really even out there. That is the only way that you will live out this verse. Otherwise, it's always about the grass is always greener, I can get better, I can do more. Okay? And that's just not, that's not even true. The standard all throughout Scripture is that husbands are to be one woman men. Period. It's even a standard to be a leader in the to be a one-woman man. And lastly, it's a man who fears the Lord. Proverbs 14, 26. He who fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for his children it will be a refuge. Guys, as the provider of your home, as the person, your job is to be the spiritual leader of your home, and that means you're supposed to set the tone for your home. And you need to just realize this. And this is humbling. That for your wife and for your children, you are the number one defining factor 
in terms of their quality of life. They live in a house that you've provided for them. They live in a place that's probably oriented around your job. Their whole life is designed around what God has led you to do. And I know that's not universally true anymore. But your kids, they live in a world you have created for them. You create the standards and the boundaries and everything that frames your household. You determine how much of your house and how much of your practices are going to be revolved around God and how much are not. Your children are looking to you to create the tone and set the primary example of what it means to follow Jesus. What it means to be a man. What it means to be married. And so, marriage is from God and ultimately Marriage, Paul says, is supposed to teach us about God. And says that the husband is to the wife as Christ is to the church. And that as Jesus laid down his life so that we could be washed pure, so the husband should lay down his life as she submits in reverence to him. And so, as the praise team comes forward and leads us in the closing song. The leaders are just going to be kind of interspersed around. And so if you have any prayer requests, if you need to talk, or if you would like to explore more about Jesus, or maybe even pray and ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, we want to be here for you and we invite you to come.